Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Steve Teresi. I'm the Senior Director of Technical Services here at JL Audio. And today I am enjoyed with none other than Mr. Rob Haynes from Southern California. Please say hello, Rob. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Our special guest is hidden behind a curtain and will remain that way. His name is Kevin Ferry. He is joining us from the greater Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, but he's not feeling too well today. Don't worry, it's not what you're thinking. He just has the flu, just has the flu. So he's gonna stay relatively silent. Uh, he's coughing right now as I look at my thing. <laughs> But um, we have a presentation that we want to walk through today. There is no keynote like we normally do. This is kind of a more live, more dynamic training. Um, since we've launched our Max and our Tune 4 software, we've received a lot of questions and we wanted to try to answer some of those to give people a better experience with uh, using the software with a uh, single microphone that you may already have. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob, who I think is going to guide us through. And Kevin will be the man working the magic behind the scenes. So a lot of screen sharing and stuff. I have a computer here as well with some microphones. We'll have a good conversation and we'll answer whatever questions we can. Take it away, Rob. So um, <laughs> as Steve mentioned, the whole purpose of this uh, portion of the training uh, that we're going to do today really is to kind of walk you through the process of setting up Tune 4 with either a USB microphone or a USB sound card, such as a, uh, a Behringer or the uh, uh, Art USB dual pre here with an XLR microphone that plugs into them for measurements. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a USB mic or a USB sound card with the microphone. Um, they should all work the same uh, if you're not using a Mac system, of course. So um, what we're going to do is kind of walk you through the process to um, plugging in the microphone, making sure certain aspects on your computer are configured properly to make sure we have measurements. Um, there are some things we've seen in the field um, related to measurements not showing, measurements aren't showing loud enough, and they all come down to the computer's specific settings. So we'll kind of walk you through that on both Mac and Windows based computers, how to get Tune 4 set up, where to select the RTA, and we'll go through some other things as well. So it looks like Kevin's got his screen share up, and I'm actually going to go full screen here, so it's a little larger for everyone. But kind of what we want to do is after you launch Tune software, um, and this is a bit different now. So um, in the past, when we were some of our beta testers might know, you had to have a USB device plugged in prior to launching Tune software. So now with Tune 4 on its final version, you don't have to do that. So once Tune 4 is in, um, you know, you can plug in your USB, your, uh, USB uh, microphone um, or do it before. But when we launch it, we want to check a couple of settings first. And the first one here, it looks like Kevin has it up right now on his Mac, is under his audio settings. And when we do this, we want to make sure that the mic levels are properly adjusted. And this is going to be under the MIDI settings panel. And as if you look very closely, you can see that the inputs are up rather high. Uh, what we found is with a lot of USB microphones, um, when they plug in, if you look under your either the Mac settings or Windows settings for your actual microphone device, the input level for the microphone is really, really low. Um, a couple we've seen were um, maybe at like 10% strength on the input level. So make sure that it is properly set. If the computer has it set too low, your measurement's going to be way down on that RTA window, far below your trace, your uh, target traces, and uh, might be a little difficult to bring up, and we definitely don't want that. So on a Mac, that's going to be under your MIDI settings. And on a Windows computer, you'll also, again, right-click on your speaker for the sound settings. And from there, you can go to your um, uh, microphone or input settings and just check your levels there. Hey, Rob, can I jump in for a second real quick? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Just want to point out that uh, the, what Kevin's got set up here is actually a pretty smart way of doing things overall. The only thing I might change is right now um, the, the, the signal from the microphone is not actually going into tune. And what I would normally do with the, the MIDI settings uh, in front, the way he has it here with audio devices with his sound card selected, he has all the sliders to control the inputs on his Behringer card, one through four. Tune's only going to recognize one of those. What I would normally do is I would have Tune accepting signal from the microphone and sound card so I could see if I'm overdriving the Tune software at the same time that I'm setting that level. The, the, the uncomfortable truth here is the microphone is one thing. So, you know, I've got one of these microphones. This is the Dayton, uh, what is it, the UMM6. And I've got this one over here. It's the Audio Frog. What is this one? The UMI1. Um, 
the levels may be different depending on your computer. So when you actually launch into this setting, it'd be helpful to be able to see what your software is going to see as well. And this is true of any software. If you use an REW or any other measurement software, the computer is the first gateway from the signal coming in from the microphone. So there's a lot of settings that you need to be mindful of. And that's what we want to share with you. The MIDI settings on the Mac, it's uh, basically this one screen. You can see the sample rate. That's in the top center there where it says format 44,100 hertz. That's the sample rate of the, the measurement device. Um, and then on the window side of things, it would be a similar one. We'll pull that up in just a couple of minutes. So that, that's the only thing I would change is just please know that this is an interface issue. So not even issue. It's an inter interface situation where we have a microphone that we're bringing signal into a computer. The computer needs to process it and then pass it over to the software. Then the software will display it. We'll get to the display in just a moment. This is all about making sure things are communicating and you have proper level. The other thing is if you are using a sound card as well, you have to make sure your levels on the sound card are properly set. If this is if your gain or outputs turned all the way down, that needs to be dialed in as well. It's not just the computer, but the sound card as well. If you're using one of these with an XLR mic, you need to make sure you're not clipping the output. You're not overdriving the inputs. So you got to make sure these levels are set as well, or it will affect the measurements that you're taking with tune four. So we'll jump back to full screen here so we can have a larger view of Kevin's window. So once we confirm our settings and our uh, in the computer are good, um, now we can kind of go into tune and start getting all of that configured. So we're always going to start on the measure tab. And then those three bars in the top left corner that Clevin, Kevin just uh, clicked next to uh, where it says RA and spectrograph, that pops up the measure settings. And uh, this is a, a lot of stuff in this window, um, more so when Max is connected. It does tell you if there's a Max hardware system connected or not. Um, we're going to pretty much stay on the general tab right now because that's where our, our basic controls for a USB connection are going to be. So we need to make sure that we have our input selected, that Tune knows what to look for as its microphone source. So under input from, you'll see the drop down there when you click on it and you're gonna pick whichever device is the one you need to, to connect. So we can see like Kevin's computer right now has picked up his webcam, his microphone. We don't want those. We want his Behringer sound card. So he's gonna select the Behringer right there. We then need to select the channel. So the channel is gonna be whichever input on the device the microphone's plugged into. In this case, it's a sound card with four channels. Kevin's microphone's plugged into channel one. So we're gonna select channel one. If you're using just a USB microphone, it should default to channel one um, automatically. If it doesn't, just go in there, select channel one. That's your only option because it's a microphone plugged straight into your computer. So after we do that, we verify our sample rates good. Um, the other thing I would like to do on, in, on the screen at this time is to also set up the output for the signal generator. So again, we have a couple of options. Are you using, uh, if you have a sound card, are you using the sound card as your output? Uh, if you're using a, a USB microphone, you're probably going to use the output of your computer as the uh, for the signal generator. So again, select whatever output is going to be playing the signal generator. So in this case, Kevin, again, uh, kind of small for me to see, but looks like he selected the Behringer sound card. He did. He's got the Behringer for both his input from, and that'll be on channel one, and the signal generator will go out the RCA level outputs on the uh, the Behringer card. And uh, what okay. Rob was saying is is a really good point. You can use the, the computer's audio out. Just use the headphone out to RCA or even aux to aux and go directly into your um, your system under measurement. Uh, obviously, most of you guys are probably mobile audio, but you can send the signal to any audio system to measure. Yep, absolutely. So after we have all of that stuff um, set up, uh, it's a good time now to, um, actually, I guess while we're still on the screen, a good thing to look at also right below that, uh, you'll see a couple uh, destinations. These are the default locations for both the target uh, files and for any saved traces that you may be taking. So if you do want to change the location where our uh, files are stored, you can do that there. If you're not sure where those are on both Mac and Windows computers, under your documents folder, you'll find a folder called JL Audio. And in there, you'll see a tune folder. And within there, you'll see your target and trace folders, in addition to your project file folders um, that you may be used to seeing that already with tune having the project uh, uh, folder in there. 
And now we've just added the traces and target folders as well. But of course, you can always change them uh, as you like. And you can also reload, um, if I remember correctly on this screen, uh, the default settings, Steve, or is that under your regular settings? You do have an option here to revert to default setup. Um, there's a couple of things that are not actually sure. part of the setup file, and that has to do with the position uh, and what type of graphs are displayed. Uh, that will persist from your last launch of the software. So right now, if you look at Kevin's screen, he's got meters and gains on the top, and he's got RTA on the bottom. That is the default setup. So when you first launch the software, that is what you should see. But you could change those, and uh, the TuneSoft will, re will remember what you had uh, used last time. The thought being that if you're in a tuning session and you shut down, when you relaunch, you're still in that same tuning session. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it a little bit easier to go from one to the next to the next without having to go back and put everything where you wanted it. Uh, that is so, one of my favorite features. It even brings up your last loaded targets. Exactly so you right. Do a so, lot of say three-way subwoofer with the subwoofer, uh, you know, target curve systems. It automatically brings those targets up when you load, and you can change that if you like. But I love having those features, your settings, your everyday type stuff, always just popping up for you, and just expedites the process. So now that we select. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry, as you get more familiar with the software, you have the ability to save your current setup as a as a specific thing. So if you if somebody else borrows your computer and screws up all your graphs and, and everything else, you could save a current setup. And then when you launch, you could load that setup and go back to the, the settings that you prefer. Um, and that includes uh, settings like your microphone levels and things of that nature. So yep. it is kind of neat that we have a default setting, but you can define your own and save different settings if you have different people using the same you know, uh, measurement system. Yep, absolutely. All right, so now, okay. clearly do not disturb does not work on my computer when someone calls. <laughs> All right, so going back to Tune, now that we've got our inputs and outputs configured, um, we can go ahead and close out from there and start looking at what's on the measure tab. Now, right now, it looks like I'm seeing some green jumping up and down on the meters and gains window there. So that means we do have uh, something coming in to the microphone. Now, if you launch Tune and don't see anything on the measurements and gain, or don't see anything on the RTA, that means we probably haven't selected our device yet. So in the top right corner of the signals and gain window, you can see it mentions the sound card right there. So if you click on that, this is where we select the input source for the device. So right now we have the sound card connected and we can see um, it's probably my voice being picked up by Kevin's microphone that we do have something jumping up and down there. But we don't see anything on the bottom window on the RTA. So let's go ahead and fix that, because that's been one of the common questions we've seen. I got my mic plugged in, but there's nothing on the RTA. What do we do? And actually, Kevin, can you go ahead and make that uh, a larger RTA window for me real quick, please? We'll switch over to RTA. So now we need to do the same thing. In that top right corner, that's where our input selection is going to be. So when Kevin uh, clicks on it, we can see it looks like it's the first one. There's the sound card, but it's not selected. So go ahead and select it. Now it's got that green uh, play triangle next to it, and its little icon doesn't have the red line through it. That means now that the RTA is using this, in this case, the Behringer sound card with an XLR microphone. But we have nothing on the window. Where's my measurement? Where so, is it? Well, it's probably a case of the levels. <laughs> so if you see that arrow that Kevin kind of just circled uh, with his mouse, that's telling you down below is where your measurement's going to be. And this is where we can start playing around with offset to start adjusting stuff to bring up our measurement. So, so real quick, Rob, I'll, you know, yes. by default, the um, the R, the when you're on the RTA screen, the targets that are already loaded in, like the ones that are on Kevin's screen right now, those are already offset by, I think it's 7040. It looks like 74 dB. Um, and what that scale is, it's, it's a dB full scale is what you're looking at. So we've kind of shifted that up. So that at an ambient level in a car, somewhere around 75 to 80 dB in a car, these these targets will be present where we think your acoustic level may be. 
Now, all of this is just position on a graph. So we can change all of this and we can see actual measurements after we calibrate things a little bit better later. But what Kevin, he's got the little field highlighted right now. Before he makes any changes there, if you look at the bottom center of the actual graph, you'll see kind of a brownish colored arrow that's pointing down and it's filled in as solid. What that is telling us is that the current active trace is this brownish color one and the current data for it is off the screen to the bottom. You could also, not on this screen, but you may also see it on the top and in extreme examples, you could see it on the left or the right of the screen. So if you don't see anything happening on the graph, look at the edges and see where your data may live. So now I think what Kevin's gonna do is he's gonna put in an offset where that uh, value is up in the upper right-hand corner. He's just highlighted it and now he's putting in a value that looks like 110 and look, he's offset the trace by 110 and has put it close to where the, the target curves are. Now you could position this by going higher or lower any way you'd like. There are certain numbers that would make sense. And I think Rob's going to touch on that. So I don't want to steal this thunder. Yeah, no. Yeah. But first of all, one thing we probably should do since we're taking actual measurements here is play pink noise. So you can tell right now by looking at that RTA, it's solely picking up Steve and myself talking. So if Kevin wants to turn on the signal generator real quick up in the top right corner there, he's got uh, pink noise. It uh, looks like uh, Pink or periodic pink noise selected. Doesn't really matter right now for what we're doing. We just want some noise. He's going to click play. And I'll be quiet for a moment. And we should see what the pink noise sounds like. There we go. And now we got all the speakers playing. You need so to let me go in. Now the, the RTA is actually maybe a little too high over our measurements. So again, we can use that offset in the top left corner, the or, or the top right or top right corner, the orange numbers there, or you can click on the input and change it and lower the number a bit. So they kind of start to, to uh, alter their position, if you will, on the measurement. And this isn't necessarily changing what the actual measurement is. It's changing the overlay, comparing your targets and where the measurement is on the screen. It's not affecting what the acoustical results is. It's all uh, graphical at this point. So just like that, we now we have an RTA up and running. Um, it's on bars. If we want, we can click the lines dot in the top. If you prefer prefer the lines, for me, I like the lines a little more than the bars. From the way I tune, I try to make every single bar perfect. Where uh, with the lines, it's a little easier to not you know <laughs> micro tune and start trying to fix stuff that's not going to have much of a difference. So just like that, we now have our RTA up and running using pink noise from tune running out of a Behringer sound card. Again, if we had a USB microphone, you could just run it out of your computer via the uh, um, uh, mini jack output into whatever device that we're uh, going to be measuring. And in this case, I think uh, Kevin's just running the sound card um, in and out and no stereo or anything like that. So, so Rob, can I jump in again? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there were a couple of questions, and I apologize. I haven't been minding the chat as carefully as I should have. You've been speaking, Rob. But I saw someone was uh, looking for some more details on how to set up the SIG Gen to make it work. So I mm -hmm. did want to spend a moment on that. And I think I saw another question about the microphones that we've mentioned, um, like the Audio Frog mic, the Date mic, and, and so forth. So I'm going to start with the microphone question first, and then I'll come into the signal generator that uh, Kevin has on the screen now. Look at the screen while I go through this. So uh, the first mic that I had mentioned, I believe, was the UMM6, which is a USB-based microphone. And you connect that using one of those standard printer cables, right? So you plug the the printer cable end into the microphone, and then you drop the USB into the computer, and then you configure it the way Kevin showed us on his. The, um, the Audio Frog microphone, which is this one here, has a neat little adapter. It's got like uh, eighth inch plugs that go in, and it's got a USB adapter. So that's, uh, I guess it's like a USB adapter for um, an eighth inch plug for the Audio Frog microphone, and that one works really well as well. Kevin's using a Behringer uh, sound card. Um, I don't have one to show you, but I have a USB dual pre, and that one takes advantage of using, uh, this is a Dayton microphone again, and this is an XLR that plugs into this directly or with a cable. Uh, cables make it a lot more portable, but this um, plugs in as a USB as well, just like the USB microphone did. So even though the microphone is XLR at this point, the connection to your computer would be USB. So when same it comes to Behringer. microphones, there's the Behringer. So the same yeah, kind of thing with an XLR. XLR is here and then your USB and the, connection yeah. there on the back. Exactly. So that should answer that. Now there's, um, I'm going to 
kind of mess up a little bit, but there's a, a way to set the level on microphones to make sure you're getting the proper uh, reading on your screen. Uh, it involves buying something that looks like this. This is a, um, it's a calibration device. And normally it comes with, hang on, let me remove this part. No, no, that was the right part. So it's got an inset there. And if you look carefully inside, there's a small little speaker. And I'm going to annoy everybody by playing a tone. That's right, so <laughs> basically what that's doing is it's playing a 1K tone at a specific decibel reading that they know because they built the device. What you can do is you can take your microphone, put it into the calibrator, play the tone and look at the, the software and you could adjust using the level offset that Kevin showed earlier until the screen is reading the value of 94 dB, which is what this is putting out. Then you've calibrated your uh, measurement screen to match an SP, a dB SPL screen. So now your SPL readings would actually mean something. Otherwise, it's just relative to a screen, which is also fine. It doesn't have to be calibrated unless you want to compare the measurements to some other system that was also calibrated to dbSPL. So there's that. Now the SIGGEN, which was there, and if I snap my fingers, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the signal generator, let me just talk about this real quick. The signal generator is actually incredibly powerful. And as Kevin showed earlier, we can route this to any output device that your computer may have. In this case, he's using his sound card, um, as he chose there. But you can see there's a bunch of different options that he has connected to his computer. When you use this on your computer, your devices will be selected. Be mindful that the system is looking at any audio device. So he has microphones there. You can't really send audio out a microphone. You can try, but it's not going to work. <laughs> so make sure you're selecting something that has a true output. And once you've done that, you can then go into the signal generator. And by default, we have real-time generation selected with a green, a big green play button. Also by default is pink periodic noise, but as Rob mentioned earlier, you can play a bunch of different things like sign and square waves, pink and white noise, periodic pink and periodic uh, white noise. We like pink periodic noise. There's a, a number of technical reasons why we like to use that. Um, you can change it though, whatever you want to do. You have the an ability thing, to set... Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. Obviously, the other thing I like on there, since you mentioned like sine waves and square waves, like Kevin, you don't have to play the sine wave, but if you... Uh, you know, select the sine wave the option there. It also then gives you the frequency. So you have full control of yep. what specific frequency. So if you want a 2,948 hertz sine wave, you can play that specific sine That's wave. That's what I use all the time, that exact frequency. Yeah, it's right? amazing, you guessed it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you also have the ability to set the, the level. And by default, we have minus 12 as, as the level that we use. And again, there's a number of technical reasons for that beyond the scope of what we need to cover today. There's another thing that we can do. It's a file playback. So if uh, Kevin goes over and goes down by the green arrow, there we go. If you click file playback, you can then load a WAV file. And the software, when you down, download it, will have a few in there. It looks like Kevin's made a couple already. But there's log sweeps that are included. And um, you can also export a sound file from the generator and play it back as a wave. So this is helpful if your audio system does not have an aux in or a way to get signal in. You can get a USB drive and play it that way if your, your audio system has that. Um, and because it's a WAV file, you can play anything. Any file that you can possibly get as a WAV file, you can play back to the system. And technically, you could use that as a stimulus for any of your measurements if you want to. But for our examples today, we're going to stick with uh, real-time generation and pink periodic noise. So let's go ahead and fire that up again, and I'll put it back over to Rob. Thanks for the diversion, Rob. Yep, not <laughs> a problem. We'll go back full screen just so everyone's got a little bigger view, and they don't have to look at our ugly mugs, even though they're tiny. So we have so far, we've gone through... We have selected the inputs and outputs for our sound card. We've configured the signal generator. We've made sure in the RTA and meters and gain window that we've selected the device, whether it's a sound card or a USB microphone. And we've talked about how to offset the display to make sure our measurements line up over our, um, our targets or our EQ controls. So right now we've got a live RTA measurement. So there's a couple other cool things that we did want to talk about um, how to how to really to take advantage of having the RTA measurement. So uh, first thing I wanted to show is how to capture a trace. Um, this is an important uh, uh, tool to have, especially when you're system tuning. You know, in a perfect world, we want to try to have our left and right um, 
speakers or um, you know frequency responses match as closely as possible to help improve that center image. So this is a really cool uh, feature when we're trying to match you know left and right to one another. So if Kevin wants to turn on maybe a, a, a single speaker real quick, playing pink noise, maybe output A, Kevin. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> There we go. Sorry, I'm a needy guy. <laughs> so we, we're not going to try to do stuff perfect here. We're not going to tune, but what we want to do is be able to capture a trace and then compare it to another speaker. Right. So in the bottom right corner of the RTA, next to the JL Audio badge, you'll see that little orange camera. That's how we capture a trace. So when Kevin clicks on it, you're going to get a pop-up saying to capture the trace. And this is where we can name it if we want. Um, some people don't like naming them. Some people do. So whatever you want to do, whatever makes it easier for you to know what trace you're looking at, do it. So in this speaking uh, of easy, if I may just jump in real quick, I'm lazy and I don't like getting my hand off a keyboard and going down to the capture button. So, so you know, you could hit the space bar on your computer and it'll call up the same capture trace dialog box that you see right now. I'm sure we'll show that on the next capture. So go ahead and click OK there. So now that's been saved. So now if Kevin mutes output A and turns on output B, we can compare the two Wait. different speakers. Before we compare, is is it possible to change the resolution of that? Because right now you're at, uh, what is it, one six banding? It absolutely is. That's one of the cool things, actually. When you capture a trace, it's not just a screen capture of the graphic. It is all the data. So now what Kevin can do is he can change from bars to lines for that trace. He can change the smoothing, whether it's more detailed or less detailed. So it's not just a graphical picture. You, we are literally capturing the data and able to manipulate it as if it was taking a live measurement still. And that's and you can really scale cool. that so too? Can you, you can scale, scale that up and that down? Too. Yep. You want to show us how to do that real quick, Kevin? With the offset. All right. You can use the arrow keys to move up and down on the graph and the plus and minus keys to change the scaling. And you'll see that the data that's been captured will scale with it. <laughs> Kevin's fidgeting. This was not part of the script. There you go. So you'll see that the data actually scales appropriately. So like Rob was saying, it captures all of the data and only displays what your current settings are for the display, which is pretty cool. So sorry yeah. about that, Rob. I just wanted to make sure we captured that. No, no, that's actually a very, very good point. And uh, uh, again, a very cool tool to have. Even if you already have, a, say, a capture taken, you get your left and right dialed in, but want to really start fine tuning it, you can play with that smoothing to start to look for you know smaller areas that may need to be adjusted or compared. Um, so a very powerful tool to have. Um, if we want to turn the traces off, that's also going to be in that top right corner where we select our inputs. Now, if you look down below, we have a bunch of traces that we can, uh, the targets and traces that we can remove from the RTA window. So if Kevin clicks out right there, the trace is gone, but now he's also turning off our, our targets. So our summed response, the individual pass bands for each target. Now he's turned on his tweeter. He's got the measurement. And now we're only looking at that captured trace and the target for output A in this scenario. So um, lots of flexibility with what you can show on the screen. You can have your, all your targets, you can add traces, remove traces, remove your targets, add them all from that dropdown. Now, if you capture a lot of traces, just be, be aware that list can get very long. And that's why I like to name them just so I know if I'm looking at, especially in a more complex system, if I'm looking at a left tweeter or a right tweeter, that way I always make sure I have the proper uh, captured trace I want to look at selected. So, but again, very, very powerful having uh, those, not just the ability to capture them and compare them, but to change the, the uh, smoothing, change the um, scaling on them. So really, really neat feature there. Uh, There's another the feature that's kind of buried in there a little bit. Uh, Kevin's kind of hovered over the resave as, and if he uh, selects that, the resave as, you can actually change the color as well. And change the name of it so you can click on the color change and 
it's off the screen. You have a color wheel and you could put a, a more desirable color, maybe something that's easier to see on your screen, or maybe you have a certain color scheme that you're following on the left side of your car or the right side of your car, or whatever the case may be. And when you resave that, it'll resave again, all the data with the new name if you change it and the new color if you change it. They have the option to replace it as he's done there. So, yeah. Perfect. So uh, now that we've done that, let's um, let's go ahead and EQ that bad boy. Let's uh, let's take advantage of the EQ to target functionality. So uh, if Kevin wants to play output A again. So just for the record, not everybody actually, knows that we have such a feature. So while Rob is uh, getting that all, or while Kevin's getting it all set up, there is a function built into the software, the free version of the software, by the way, um, to auto set EQ to target. And what Kevin has right now is a red target for his tweeter, and he's playing a driver that is a tweeter, basically. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull up the EQ panel. And in the EQ panel, you'll see that the left tweeter output and the target are already selected. So whatever channel you're currently on will be reflected there. Kevin, just humor me and click on channel B over on the side on the outputs. As you change there, you'll see that it's changed now the left mid output and the target is now the target sum. And that'll track as you click the different outputs, the EQ panel will also track with it. So you know that you're working on the correct trace at a given time. And the other thing that I like is if when you change the output in the EQ um, panel there, it knows what target it's attached to. So when I did my car, you know, my three ways up front, when I selected left tweeter, it had tweeter. When I drop, moved the drop down to right tweeter, it stayed tweeter. When I moved to mid-range, it moved to the mid-range target. So all of those are tied together to really expedite the tuning process and make sure you're uh, adjusting to the proper target that you want. So going back to output A there, which was tied to um, the tweeter target, again, you can select it there, or as Kevin just did, select output A in the bottom right corner. So next to that, you'll see auto set EQ. And this, when you click it, runs a pretty powerful uh, calculation process that, that looks at the measured response, looks at what the target curve is, and makes, I, I, Steve might have the, the answer, but I would imagine thousands of calculations yes, to lots, center lots frequency, <laughs> uh, the gain level, and the Q to make that match. So if Kevin wants to hit auto set EQ there, we should be able to, oh, we're going to put a high pass filter on first. Yeah, that's the best thing to do because right now the EQ would be asked to pull all that data down to the curve. So what of he's course, doing now is tuning that would already be set. The we're just having right. some fun here. So when you get it really close, and what Kevin's done, it's it's very subtle, but what he's done is he's brought the trace down to to come pretty darn close and actually touch the target curve on the on the the part where it's sloped downward towards where it says 2K, and on the top end you'll notice that the measured data is also crossing the target curve. What we don't want is we don't want the target curve so far below or so far above your actual captured data. You want it somewhere close to it like Kevin has now. That gives the EQ the best opportunity to actually do its job. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let Kevin hit the auto set. Oh, ah, before he does. <laughs> I don't know if Rob said it. I was kind of looking at the chat a little bit. But what we're about to demonstrate will work with or without a VXI or MVI amplifier. But if you are connected to a VXI or MVI amplifier, the changes that are done here will affect the signal in real time as Kevin demonstrated with the high pass filter. You can use this on any DSP that you may already have. You'll just need to take those values and enter it into your software for that uh, DSP and you'll see the changes then reflected in tune measurement software. So go ahead, Kevin, mash that auto set EQ button, see what happens. Ah, uh, what did you change? I didn't want you to change it. I wanted you to get me an error. <laughs> okay, so if he hits the button now, he's going to get a message that says, ah, oh, we can't do this. Measurement data must be selected or real-time data must be selected. The software currently has the opportunity to apply equalization settings to captured traces, believe it or not. Now, this is sort of an edge case that uh, you may or may not ever need in your lifetime, and we are working on some improvements to make this experience a little bit easier for you. But what it's basically saying is I can't apply an EQ to match a target if I'm on the target. That's what it's telling us. So what Kevin was doing by going to the drop-down menu and changing from the tweeter target 
he was changing it to the live data, the actual measurement data. So you could do that a couple of different ways. The way I like to do it is I click OK and I use the Z key. So just to give you an idea what the Z key is doing is on a graph across the bottom edge, you have an X axis, which in this case is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. On the left side of, your, of the graph, you'll see that it has a dB scale. That's the Y axis. And in this case, it's from somewhere around 42 up to about 108 dB. There's also a Z axis, which is the front of the graph. And then going three dimensional into the graph changes the Z order. So by hitting the Z key, you can rotate through the different traces. So now you can sort of tell that the, the, the tan or whatever, that's a weird color, but whatever that color is, is now at the front of the Z order. You can also do this as Kevin was doing a moment ago by going to the upper right hand corner of the menu and dropping down and selecting the live data or the other data. In this case, he's gonna select that live data, which it is at the front of the Z order. And now when he use auto set EQ to target, it will function appropriately. Go ahead and do it, there we go. It takes a really long time, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and you see that it automatically applied the equalization to match that target pretty darn good. You'll also notice that it did not try to make that tail end at the extreme high frequency. We didn't try to force that to match the target. The system is smart enough to know that if it can't do it naturally, trying to beat it into it is not a good idea. The same would be true on a subwoofer. If we had a low pass filter and the, the low frequencies were rolling off, it's not going to try to force it to, to match a target curve on a, what would normally be a, a natural roll off. Now, if you got the result that you got here, I, I don't know about you guys, but I think that's a pretty good result right out of the gate. Um, but if you got results that you think you could do better, you do have the ability to move the EQ sliders and make changes on your own. In other words, the auto set EQ to target is not the end. It's actually just the beginning. You can do all of this manually. You don't need auto set EQ to target. You could do it one band by one band by changing the frequency Q and gain or you can have auto set EQ attempt to get you as close as it possibly can. But again, if the results are not as good as you want or different than you were expecting, you could either reset the EQ and run it again. You could turn off everything it did and start over and do it on your own. The choice is yours. We're just here to guide you. One other cool thing, actually, Kevin, go ahead and reset the EQ real quick. You probably wouldn't need this on a, on a smaller band, like a, a tweeter here, where we're not uh, adjusting as much as, say, we might want to be able to adjust on a mid-range. But you can also determine how many bands are using uh, for that adjustment. So Kevin can actually, by clicking those icons on the right, he can actually defeat the band. So now if he runs auto set EQ again, it's only going to use four bands. So whatever ones you did not use for your auto set you can then unlock and use for salt and pepper and any other adjustments without affecting the actual automated correction uh, that tune applies. So uh, kind of cool. So point that you up, Robert, but I'm glad you remembered it. That's a huge one. If you wanted to, what I call save bands for later, that's the way you do it. Another thing I do want to point out that the auto set EQ to target is using the actual visible data. It's not using all of the data. It's using whatever the visible data is. So the reason I bring this up is currently we're at one sixth octave banding on this data. And you can see we get very smooth results, very close to the, to the target curve. At high frequencies, I recommend this. One sixth octave is probably what I would use on a tweeter like we've done here. But as we go lower in frequency, I might switch it up to one twelfth or one twenty fourth. And you can see that it's a little bit more jagged now. Although that result is pretty good too, to be honest. <laughs> But you'll find that as you go lower in frequency, you might want to uh, change the banding to give you a bit more resolution. Chasing your tail at high frequencies with all those little deviations is kind of silly and it's kind of wasteful in terms of time and EQ bands. So, uh, you know, Rob, thank you for pointing out the way to save those bands. And another way to save that is by not going to 148th octave on a tweeter. Yep. And a couple other things real quick uh, while we're on the auto EQ. As Steve mentioned, with VXI or MVI uh, amplifiers, this will adjust their parametric EQs on board automatically. But if you're using a non VXI or uh, MVI DSP in that panel that's popped out, it gives you all of the numbers. It tells you where the center frequency for the band is, the gain for the band and what the Q is. So if you're working with a PEQ, all you have to do is input those numbers into the individual bands on your DSP 
and you should get the same results that the uh, Tune to Target gave you inside of Tune 4. So just write those down, input them in, and you should be good to go uh, when it comes to using the RTA. So I might not automate every DSP. It gives you all the numbers. still takes all the guesswork out, and all you have to do is type in what the results are. Another thing we can do is in this scenario, we uh, applied the EQ to just a, uh, a specific speaker target, but we can also EQ to a summed response as well. If we wanna do that real quick, Kevin. So we'll click up in the top here and we're now gonna bring up our target sum, which is the yellow. And that's the summed response of the individual targets once they're all combined. And they don't have to be on the screen. The target file itself knows what the sum response is from when you build the targets in the in the uh, the target uh, generator portion of Tune. So again, if we launch the EQ, reset it, and uh, apply the correction, oh, maybe we need another. So again, it didn't adjust anything being we only have the high pass uh, filter playing on that channel. But if we had more content playing, it would adjust everything to what that summed response is. So a uh, little more flexibility again when you're using that. It doesn't have to be just to a specific speaker target. You can do it for a summed full, full range target as well. So that's someone um, in the chat was asking about the, the targets themselves and what I, I just answered them. Um, who was that again? That was Aaron. Um, and uh, basically what he was asking is, can you customize the targets? And the answer simply is yes. We do provide a bunch of them and you can customize and tailor them any way you'd like. And that includes, as Kevin's been showing, band specific targets that sum to a sum target. I think we may not have enough time today to get into all the details of the target generator, but suffice to say, it's incredibly powerful and we will be talking about it in the future. There is an article on our help center. So if you go to um, jlaudio.com and you click on the support link on the very top of the page, uh, in the help center, there is a tune section. And within the tune section is a tune four and Mac section. And in there, there is a very detailed article about how to create targets and it'll actually will walk you through the steps on um it really it's just kind of like tuning a car <laughs> like if, if you didn't know any better you would think you were tuning a dsp and not making targets because you use pretty much the same controls it you is. use the high pass and low pass filters in the bottom of the screen there to create the pass bands for for each channel you use the eq to sum or to um, alter what you want the summed the the shape of the sum response to be uh, we even recommend that you look at the phase, the interactions between the, the two targets, because in the target generator, it's going to mimic all of those real life behaviors. So when you have a high pass and a low pass filter, that natural crossover behavior is going to show in the target. And if they're not in phase with one another, it'll actually affect your sum, respo your sum response due to the natural cancellations that can happen. So you can well, actually look at the... I'm going to jump in. I just got to say that for me, yeah. the target generator as a trainer is one of the most powerful tools we've ever created because I can show driver interactions. What would happen if these two signals mixed together? I could show that and show the interactions both in time as well as level and frequency, all of it. All of it is visible in the target we generator. We can actually show what an all-pass filter does. You can actually yep. see it. <laughs> Indeed you can. That for me, is cool. Like being yes. able to look at a phase response and say, okay, this one, this here's got, you know, the phase here is wrapping differently than the other channel. We'll put a, a all pass filter on, play around and move the frequency until you see the two channels overlap. And if you turn that all pass filter on and off with your sum response showing, you'll actually see the sum response dip a bit in that crossover region when there's when they're not aligned in phase. So there's a lot of cool things. So here we can see that they're in phase. And I imagine we probably have an all pass filter turned well, on. That, on that that's delay. the target phase right there is what he's showing. Right. So you can see those are the band specific target traces. He's got the red for the tweeter. He's got gray for mid range. I think it's purple for the subwoofer. And you'll see that the three drivers are all in a react uh, are uh, interacting properly in the phase mm -hmm. response. One transfers to the next, which transfers to the next. So it's nice and smooth. That's what we would look for. It's very, so, very powerful. Yeah, very cool. it's very powerful. As Steve said, it's way more than we have time to get into today. Um, you know, the, the default targets that we have uh, included with Tune4, 
Uh, it's a target response that we've had tons of success with over the years at JL Audio. From our experience, it just provides a good all around pleasing sound. Again, you can manipulate it if you want. If you want it, you know, maybe you like the, the pass bands of all the channels, but you want the shape of the curve to be a little different. Play with the PEQ and you can adjust all of that. You Show that real quick, Kevin. Own. Yeah, there you go. I wanted Kevin to, to grab an EQ band. Notice what's happening. So the gray and the red are the tweeter and the mid-range driver or mid-range mid-bass driver. And the yellow is the summed response of the two of them put together. And as he's moving that EQ on the sum target, it's affecting the bands that are summing to it. So we would recommend that you do your high and low pass filtering on band specific and, and, and no equalization there. We would recommend doing all your equalization on a sum target because it will cascade down and impact all the bands that would be uh, related to that. So Kevin, if you don't mind and, and put that EQ band right around 5K where the, the crossover point is, you'll notice that both the red and the gray are affected because it bleeds over. And if you had a wider Q on that, you'd see that it would affect each of them even more. You don't like the right the right key. <laughs> okay, there we go. So if he makes that nice and wide, you'll see that it's affecting more of that. That shows the power of the interactions of these two drivers as you, you go through that process. <laughs> so I just messed up your target curve. <laughs> and again, target when you're in target generator mode, you'll notice everything is highlighted orange. So on top of targets under the mute icon being orange, on the top of the crossover panel, the, e, the delay polarity panel, the level trim panel, the EQ panel, that orange highlight is how you know you're in target gen mode. Oh, I want to so, show something. <laughs> yeah, do that. Pull that panel out. Yeah, pull that over. There's a, a new function that's in Tune 4 software, and it really shows itself right here. And I, if Kevin will indulge me, I want to show this off pretty good. Right now, we have a tweeter high pass at 5K and a corresponding mid-range low pass at that same frequency. But what I can do is I can turn on HP and LP tracking up in the top there, that one there. When it's selected like that, now I can actually put a little checkbox next to the 5K, make that. So that's my high pass filter. And now I'm going to go to the low pass filter for my mid range. No, 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 not all of them. Turn those off. There you go. That one. No, 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 not that one. That one. Yes. So now what I've done is I'm linking the high pass filter and uh, for the tweeter and the low pass filter for the mid range. And if I change this, you'll notice the two of them are tracking together, but the summed response does not change. So if you can indulge me for a moment more, Kevin, if I keep it a 5K and uncheck one of those two boxes, now change it. You see how the sum response is changing and the other the other uh, filter frequency is not. You can actually, what I would normally have done earlier, Kevin applied a high pass filter and got rid of a bunch of energy that the tweeter was able to play. What I might have done, I might have come in here and brought the high pass and um, low pass filters down lower to match the response of the driver a little bit more naturally. There is a caution tale that I need to share with you. Please pay attention to this. If you decide to lower the high pass target for your tweeter, make sure you don't go so low that you're trying to get this thing to play frequencies that it really doesn't want to play. Just because it could do it naturally doesn't mean it wants to keep doing that forever. So if you see the natural roll off is somewhere around 3K, I would not cross it over at 3K. I'd probably put it at maybe 35 or 4,000. 3,500 or 4,000, just to keep it outside of the danger zone as I like to look at it. The HP and LP tracking can lead you down a dangerous path if you forget that you're dealing with actual speakers here. It's not just electronic stuff. It's real speakers that need to move and track with that. So thanks for indulging me, Kevin. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I, I think we kind of covered what we wanted to cover today. We talked about setup. So again, once your device is plugged in, uh, just go to those settings in the top left corner. Make sure your device is selected in the input and uh, output for the signal generator. There's even a refresh icon there. So let's say you accidentally, your mic comes unplugged, plug it back in, click refresh, and that will no. just reestablish the connection. Don't even need refresh. Oh, there we yeah. go. So, hey, actually, why don't you, can you switch over to my computer over here? I can. here cancel all right so on this computer you guys see it okay yep we'll go full screen here again um th this one i'm using um 
yeah so i'm using the audio frog mic so i select it there and i select my channel it, my sample rate is okay i can hit refresh and it's just going to say it's refreshing all that stuff it's going to disconnect and everything's good i come in here and i select my microphone and poof i'm taking measurements right so it's something's different something's wrong here you guys see this this uh data notice that there's no bass I'm telling you, this is a good microphone. I'm talking directly into it. Uh, this is a good microphone, and it can measure bass. Something's wrong. What do you think is wrong, guys? Anyone getting any Ooh. answers there? Well, we have a bit of a delay on the Facebook, but I would okay. imagine it's something about special effects. Something along those lines. So Kevin earlier showed the uh, MIDI interface for uh, a PC. What I'm going to show you is on, uh, sorry, MIDI interface for uh, a Mac computer. What I'm going to show you now is uh, the MIDI, the sound settings for this particular computer, which is a PC, right? So I am using a USB device microphone. And if I click on the properties for this one, notice it's um, in the recording and not the playback. I'm in the recording setting. So I go into here and I hit the properties. And if I go to advanced, you see here it says enable audio enhancements. Anytime your PC is trying to enhance something for you, I'm not a big fan of that. So what I would have to do is turn off that. And when I do, and I hit apply, you'll notice in my graph, it shows that it disconnected because the setting has changed. If I hit retry, it automatically comes back and now I have low frequency energy. So when you're setting up your microphone, notice that, right? So if I unplug the microphone from the little sound card thing, it goes away and I plug it back in and it should come right back on. So you don't always need to use that refresh I, um, option, but if you have any issues hitting that, basically it's like resetting the connections to the computer. A lot of programs you need to shut the software down and then relaunch the software. It's annoying. So we put a refresh button that basically says all these devices, ignore them for a moment. Okay, now bring them all back. So it's kind of like purging the, the USB connections and giving you a, a new look at everything. So for me, I love that refresh option just from some of the, the early, early beta versions we had <laughs> having to relaunch tune every time I accidentally kicked out the USB cable or did something to the sound card, just going click and being live again makes it so awesome. Indeed. So I can't remember what we have left on our agenda here. We pretty much covered the agenda today. We talked about the initial setup using the SIG gen bringing up the RTA measurement, signals and gain. Um, okay, cool. Kevin's I was pointing at something, but I can't see what he's pointing at. He wants to hook up Max. <laughs> <laughs> <No>? <laughs> oh, he's in the chat. Uh, okay, so um, there was a question about oh. using a coax. What he wants to do is he wants to change the target to a two-way target. Right now it's a three-way where he's got a sub, a mid-range mid-bass driver and a tweeter. So now he's going to change and load a two-way target, which is provided for you. And he clicks open. And it's basically saying, I'm going to change what you've currently done. And of course, that's what we're trying to do. And he does that. Now you see it's the same target curve, but now it's a two-way system instead. And now, now, so he could technically tune his system as a two-way system, although I don't think that mid-range driver can get up to the higher frequencies very effectively. So... All right, so Ada's asking for FAQ time, but I just I gotta tease you guys. I just have to do it. Uh, are you guys okay with me doing something here? All right, so sure. on the PC, switch back to this training PC real quick. On this PC, I'm gonna disconnect the audio frog mic, and it's gonna yell at me, and I'm gonna hit cancel. I'm gonna take this other device, and I'm gonna plug it in, and turn it on. What and device would need to be turned on? Well, you need voltage sometimes. And look at that. What's it say? It says JL Audio Max is detected. So click OK. Come in here. It says to refresh. I don't even have to do that. Look, it's already identified that Max is connected, and now it's pulling data from the multi-mic. If I come in here and hit multi-mic, I'm taking measurements. There they are. Voila. And my micro array is sitting. Hey, guys, you can see me. It's, I just have it laying on my desk, right? So it's kind of a mess, but that's where my data is coming from. So here's the thing that I love about the Mac system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the USB. And when I do that, it all goes away and it's going to yell at me. There it goes. 
I'm not going to touch the keyboard. I'm only going to plug in the USB cable. And when I do that, I'll walk over here, look, not, not my sleeve, and wait for a moment. It refreshes, and it goes back to taking measurements. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, you know, I know it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but, boy, it's worth it just for that alone. <laughs> so you never have to worry about it uh, disconnecting um, and losing where you were at. So that's uh, that's pretty cool if you ask me. So Otto's looking for his. Doubt. So. Okay, so we are – kind of at an hour and I, we anticipated there may be questions. Um, I think we've, uh, I did my best to try to keep up with the chat. I failed miserably. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, if we are looking through the chat now, is there anything that we can cover fairly quickly? Um, I'm scrolling through. It looks like we covered most of them. I know there were some questions on targets. Again, you can read that article on the help center. There's also an article on pretty much everything we talked about today on setting up Tune 4 for non-max measurements and taking advantage of the uh, uh, auto to uh, EQ to target functionality. Um, my goodness, I don't really see anything else in here. Will there be a software update for EQ integration with Tweak? Oh, uh, yes. yes, thank you. I saw that in, our, too, yeah. the, in the next major update for Tune, there'll probably be some patches that come out uh, in the near future. Now that it's out in the wild, more people are using it. We're, we're hearing and seeing more things. Um, there'll be some patches for sure. But the next major update for Tune, um, which probably a few months, at least I would imagine, will add uh, tweak functionality and give you the same, uh, the measure tab abilities when working with our tweak uh, 88 and tweak D8 line of DSP processors. It's coming. We we didn't forget. It's just uh, the coding for the tweak is different than it is for the uh, VXI and MVI. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were very excited to get this out with our DSP amplifiers. Um, so we just, we did what we had to do. The tweak will get the love and the direct integration that we demonstrated with the MVI today will also be available for the tweak in the future. And it is a lot of long. Work. Was that? You know, I, I, it is a lot of work. I, I've, I've seen a lot of people. Well, how, if you could do it for VXI, how hard is it to do it with Tweak? Well, they're two different DSP chips. Correct. VXI has different uh, parameters in terms of the Q response. We have all pass filters. So it's kind of like doing it all over again in a way. Yes, we've got the interface and all of that, but the programming for the chip needs to be from scratch. We can't That's just different. recycle what we did with VXI because they're two different chips in those products so it does take time and as steve said you know we're not forgetting about the tweakers out there we, we love you just as much as we love the vxi and mvi customers but it was a matter of getting this to market and you know not having to wait a couple more months so i think we've all waited a long time as it is for this this is true this is true um so let's see what else we can do so this is the, the target generator. I do want to show a couple of things real quick. Um, one thing, and this is included with the software when you download it. Um, I'm going to quickly just turn off my, uh, I'm going to hide my trace there, right? So I'm not distracted by the actual live data. So when you're messing with the target curves, right now um, I have the, the tweeter high pass, the mid range, mid base, and subwoofer, right? And all of those, you can see by the check marks over here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that those are all adding down to what's known as the TS, which is that yellow line, the sum of all of those together, right? I could toggle it on and off. What's less obvious is there's other curves that are here. So if I select this one, I'm going to quickly just turn. The E key on your keyboard toggles the EQ overlay on and off. So you can turn that off if you want to clean up the display. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide these other traces because I want to focus in on the target sum. So there's the target sum. If I unhide this trace, you'll see that it's actually a full range target. And it's a different target curve than the current sum target. But what I can do, I can pull open the panel and I can copy this global one to the EQ sum and hit OK. Come on. Come on. And now that becomes my sum target. So when I unhide these again, now they all add up to that new different uh, sum target. 
-hmm. So there are four different target, uh, some target curves embedded in here with four different band specific targets. And you can change to any one of the other targets that you see there. This is incredibly powerful. It gives you the opportunity to have several different target curves, the sum targets, and still use the high and low pass filtering that's been set up for the other channels. You could also do an eight-way system if you wanted to, but I have no idea why you would ever do that. Uh, but in the most common application, a four-way system like you see here, you can actually change and hide other target curves within the same file. I uh, just wanted to share that with you a little bit. Yeah. So two other things real quick, Steve. Um, while we're on the target screen here, uh, Tyler was asking if we have JL's uh, house curve preloaded. Yes, the default two-way, three-way, and four-way target files are the house curve. And um, if Steve, um, the original one, that yellow sum response is our uh, default curve. But as Steve showed, we have a couple other curves that you can uh, use as well. So, you know, whatever the application uh, calls for, you may want a different curve in the marine environment or a home environment than you would want in a, in a car audio system. One other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, since we're in measure only mode right now, and this is something that'll be beneficial for the guys that are working with a tweak, um, is we can actually launch two separate Tune 4 windows now. So if you are connected to a tweak, you can launch Tune in measure mode. And then on the toolbar on the bottom, right click the icon, select Tune, and you can now launch a second Tune 4 window. Have that one connected to your tweak. Of course, we're not connected to a tweak right now. If we did, we'd have the pop up, you know, or we can go into simulation mode. That works as well. And so if we were plugged into a tweak right now, we can have Tune 4 for measurements and then a separate Tune 4 window to make the uh, adjustments to the actual DSP itself. So this is a, a new feature in Tune 4 by being able to actually have multiple instances of the software running at the same time. I don't have a big enough monitor. <laughs> the tuning exactly. rigs that I've seen very often, you'll have a separate monitor and you put it over on the other monitor, but you could see that we have the, the, the tweak interface here where I can go into the tune tab and make my adjustments here. And what Rob was explaining earlier, when we had the EQ panel open, when we do the auto set EQ, these values here can then be brought in and typed in into this little chart here. Yep. And you'll it's get like very band, similar results. It's like a band five on the measure only mode said 4,825 Hertz, negative two and a half DB Q of 1.2. Go to band five and tweak and just type those numbers in and that'll be the result that the auto correction gave you on the measurement. So very, very cool. Exactly. So. Assuming that's what it showed us. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, whatever whatever's there. So, um, again, tweak support is coming. We'll get you there so that that overlay will, will work for you um, so you don't have to do the two instances. You can also do that on the Mac as well. Um, but again, right clicking, open a second instance, and then you'll have the two, um, two different screens, one for measure and the other one for the actual DSP integration. So is Manville really asking us to do it on the Mac? Is that what he's doing? <laughs> I think Kevin might have it ready. It looks like I see a pop-up in the bottom of If he screen. does, that'd be good. My concern is very often when you're dealing with the uh, sound cards and microphone interfaces, if you launch Tune software, it may try to grab whatever microphone you're using, and then you won't be able to hear me. And that may be a good thing for all of you, but if I'm trying to share information with you, that will kind of be a detriment. But since we have a hacker kind of guy over there that can't talk, we'll go ahead and use his. Hey, there he is coughing again. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you, um, yeah. There we go. Right click on the tune icon and it'll say, um, what did it say again there? New instance, I think it was. Yeah. So now he's got two tune four windows open as well. So <laughs> there we go. So and we can only have two open, which is why it's now Correct. grayed out. Right. Exactly. So there we go. One more time. Okay. <laughs> There it is, new instance. And just like that, you got multiple tunes. So very, very cool. I did see Mark uh, for, from Car Audio Fab was asking, uh, changing the color of the captured traces. Mm -hmm. And yes, that is something that we can do as well. So if uh, Kevin actually wants to 
do that for us real quick. You uh, right click on the trace. Captured trace. Captured trace, yes. I think we still have that tweeter one there. You select to resave it, and you have the option for the, the color there. Um, you hit the dots next to it, and you have the color picker. And depending on what operating system you're working with, you may have the opportunity to enter in specific values if you want, like, you know, dolphin colors or something like that. You could do that. <laughs> and you could also rename them there. So if if you're like me and you type too quickly and you, you spell tweeter with, you know, four E's, um, mm -hmm. you have to go in there and edit it. You can do that. So does a system that utilizes dolphin colors as the targets or traces sound as poorly as they play? <laughs> well, they, they usually start off good and then just end really badly. So. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Uh, so, I mean, obviously... We just threw a whole bunch of information out at you. Um, we don't expect that everybody got all of that, and maybe we went too quickly on a number of things. Um, but I think I saw a comment about some excitement that we have. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement here at JL Audio. Um, obviously, I'm very close to all of this, and it's really great that we can finally share it. I know Kevin and Rob are really happy that no longer do we have to obscure some of the interface items that are out there. Now you know what we've been working on. Now you also know why for the past two or two and a half years we've been talking about phase and tuning and the terms and terminology that are used in tuning and audio systems. We've been building towards this. We've been waiting for this for a really, really, really long time. So now you can imagine as we go forward, we'll be using Tune software, Tune 4 software, and max measurement, as well as single microphone measurement so that we can kind of show what you have access to for free. And um, I think one of the questions I saw in the chat was, is there a paid version of the software? I didn't mean to imply that there was a paid version of the software. Tune software is completely free completely free. The only thing you need to pay for is the hardware that we've created, the microphone arrays, the five microphones, the case, all the adapters, everything that we need, that you would need to pay for if you wanted multi-microphone measurements and time-based measurements. Yes. But for free, using the USB microphone or an XLR on a sound card, like you know a dual pre like this one, all the functionality that comes with single mic measurements like RTA, spectrograph, and things of that nature, all the target curves that we showed you, the EQ overlay, all of that is available for free. All you need is an existing mic and looking at you guys, all of you, uh, maybe not all of you, but many of you already have a microphone that you can use. So at this point, we've just given you basically a whole bunch of really powerful software for you to start tuning systems on a single screen in one interface if you're using VXI or MVI. So you're welcome. <laughs> uh yeah, Steve finally decorated his office. What what you don't know is I did have a leak in the office, so I had to redo everything. So it's uh, all my pictures are finally back on the wall, except for one which broke when I took it down. So, <laughs> but yes, I'm very happy about our yellow <laughs> friend over here. <laughs> all right. Well, I think uh, that pretty much wraps it up. I think so too. Um, so thank you, everyone, for, for watching today. Uh, next week, we hope that Kevin is uh, back to full strength and can join us again and be a, a, take his rightful place on stage with the three uh, the, the, as the three amigos. Uh, we do have additional training content that we want to push forward. Um, hopefully, you can see that we are responding to your queries and questions that you may have about the software launch as well as the upcoming hardware uh, launch to the field. We will Actually, be covering sorry. that. Um, Today's training wasn't even what we were going to originally do today. We no, it wasn't. To we actually what we pivoted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely uh, we pivoted because of the the questions that we were seeing, and we wanted to give you guys the information and the ability to kind of guide us a little bit further. So ping us. Let us know what's going on. We are paying attention, and we um we're working on a couple of other little fun things for you as well. So I'm going to say good night and farewell. We'll see you next week, um, and we'll announce a topic uh, maybe tomorrow, but probably Monday. Thanks, everyone.